About a year ago, I convinced myself that I'd look a lot more jacked, especially in clothes, if I started training my neck. This was brought on by the simple observation that most jack dudes have bigger necks. Just take this photo of Magic Mike, for example. That's what he actually looks like on the left, and on the right, his neck was photoshopped to be smaller. It should be obvious which version looks more masculine and muscular, and I think this is why training your neck and traps directly can make a massive difference in how jacked you look in clothes and how masculine your face looks. So this photo of me was taken on January 1st, 2016, and this photo was taken a year later after about a year of admittedly on and off direct neck training. And the traps are another muscle that can drastically affect how muscular you look from the front, side, rear, and again, especially in clothes. So before we get into exactly how to make these muscles grow best, let's quickly cover their basic anatomy first. So let's start with the muscles on the front. The biggest, medius muscle on the neck is the sternocleidomastoid. It has two heads which originate at the top of the sternum and the top of the clavicle, respectively, inserting on the mastoid process at the base of the skull, and it performs forward flexion, lateral flexion, and rotation of the neck. A little to the side and a bit deeper, you have the three scalene muscles, acting together to perform forward and lateral flexion, much like the sternocleidomastoid. Moving more to the back of the neck, by far the biggest muscle is the trapezius, or the traps for short. The upper traps originate at the occipital bone on the back of the head, and then fan out and down to insert on the outer part of the clavicle, or collarbone. And they contract to perform primarily scapular elevation, like shrugging, but also neck extension, lateral flexion, and rotation. The fibers of the mid traps run straight across and contract to perform primarily scapular retraction, like in a barbell row, with the lower fibers performing scapular depression and retraction. Just keep in mind that all of these muscles tend to function as a unit, not in isolation. So still on the back of the head, you have two splenous muscles, which extend the neck and the levator scapulae muscle, which is buried a bit deeper and functions primarily to elevate the scapula, again, like in a shrug. And there are a bunch of other smaller muscles like the semispinalis, multifidus, longissimus, and others that all basically help to extend the neck, but we won't focus on these. It's commonly heard that if you simply focus on heavy compound movements in your training, regularly doing heavy squats, deadlifts, bent rows, and so on, you'll have no problem building a thick neck. But the research doesn't really agree with this. A study by Conley and colleagues from the University of Georgia split 22 men into one of two groups. One group performed a periodized four day per week resistance training program for 12 weeks. The training program was pretty rigorous, including exercises like the squat, Romanian deadlift, and even trap-focused movements like mid-thigh deadlifts, bent rows, shrugs, all loaded in the three to 10 rep range for three to five sets. The other group did exactly the same thing, except they added three sets of 10 rep head extensions every week. At the end of the 12 weeks, MRI was used to measure neck hypertrophy, and the results were pretty staggering. Despite all the heavy compound movements used in the regular protocol, there was zero increase in cross-sectional area of the neck muscles after 12 weeks. But adding in just nine weekly sets of direct neck extension work led to a 13% increase in total neck cross-sectional area, which is pretty impressive for only 12 weeks and led the authors to conclude that it doesn't appear that the isometric actions required for stabilization during conventional resistance exercises are of sufficient intensity to elicit neck muscle hypertrophy. However, looking at other research, such as that from Sunstrup et al., it's clear that the neck muscles are activated quite highly indirectly from other exercises, such as the lateral raise, where the splenus and trap muscles both reached over 90% EMG activity relative to momentary voluntary contraction in a set taken to failure. Granted, activation and hypertrophy are not necessarily synonymous, but it seems most plausible that all else equal, activating a muscle to a greater degree should hypertrophy it to a greater degree. So it seems that even if not required for growth, including at least one neck extension-based exercise, such as plate-loaded extensions or partner-assisted extensions, two to three times per week makes most sense to maximize growth of the rear neck musculature. I found that using a head harness can make loading a little easier, or if you'd rather not do this publicly, you can use a towel to provide resistance from home. Because loading the neck muscles heavily might put undesired strain on the connective tissues of the neck, I'd suggest starting out with moderate reps in the 10 to 15 rep range, with sets taken close to or to failure with good control so that a full spectrum of motor units are involved. So what about the front and sides of the neck? A 2010 paper by Ackland et al. looked at moment arms for the neck and found that the sternocleidomastoid showed the greatest flexion and lateral bending capacity. So if the goal is to make the neck bigger from the front and the side, we should focus on growing this muscle. A 2006 study on Navy command recruits found that performing exercises that train neck forward flexion, lateral flexion, and extension three times per week led to big improvements in neck strength. And while neck circumference did increase on average by 1.4 centimeters, it wasn't enough to reach statistical significance, probably because of the small sample size of 10. 
So in the absence of solid data, I'd recommend performing neck flexion exercises such as plate loaded neck curls or partner assisted neck curls at least two to three times per week in the 10 to 15 rep range. And with the plate loaded curl, you want to make sure you're not using your arms to hold the weight up. Let the plate rest fully on your forehead using a cloth for comfort if needed and focus on curling only with your neck, resisting the downward motion of the plate on the negative. I see lateral flexion based movements as more of an optional exercise since the sternocleidomastoid wraps around the side of the head, meaning that forward flexion based exercises should cover the side dimension as well. However, adding in a few plate loaded lateral neck curls won't hurt, just be careful not to go too heavy as the neck muscles are weaker in lateral flexion. Rotation can also be trained, however, the equipment needed to train it safely and effectively can be tough to come by, and other, in my opinion, more advanced exercises like neck bridges seem to be effective for neck strengthening in athletes, however, I personally prefer the more bodybuilding based Based movements that use weighted resistance since they're proven to be effective without needing to contort yourself into a potentially uncomfortable position. So what about the traps? Well, similar to the neck, it's commonly touted that if you just do heavy deadlifts, your traps will blow up. And certainly it makes some sense. The traps isometrically contract quite forcefully when performing heavy deadlifts in order to stabilize the scapula and keep the upper back in extension. And this is supported by some EMG data by Carbital, showing that upper trap muscle activity was 97% at the point of knee passage versus just 88% off the floor indicating that training the top half of the deadlift, such as by doing rack pulls, may be better for optimizing trap recruitment. In addition, research from Luke Beggs showed that heavier loads were, unsurprisingly, more effective at activating the upper traps, and while using a mixed grip didn't lead to significant left to right activation differences for the traps, Beggs speculated that this finding can't necessarily be extrapolated to the entire trap muscle because the measurement is limited to the relatively small area covered by the placement of the electrode, and went on to suggest that to prevent asymmetries, it may be of benefit to use a double overhand grip, and when grip becomes a limiting factor, ergogenic aids such as lifting straps, chalk, and gloves can be used, or a hook grip. However, while perhaps sufficient for growth in some, isometrically training the traps through heavy deadlifts alone may not be enough to maximize growth of the traps, especially since other research indicates that eccentric muscle actions are required to maximize muscle hypertrophy. A landmark 1994 study by Johnson and colleagues found that because of the orientation of the upper trap fibers, they can't effectively elevate the scapula when the arm is in neutral, suggesting that the shrug is best executed with the arms in at least 30 degrees abduction an idea supported by a 2013 study by Pizarri et al, which found that a dumbbell shrug performed at 30 degrees abduction, or in other words, with the arms further out to the sides, was more effective at activating the upper trap fibers than the traditional shrug. It's worth noting though that a limitation of this study could be the fact that the same loads were used for both conditions. It seems to me that it may simply be harder to do a shrug with the arms more out to the side, and perhaps a relative loading scheme would have led to different results. In any case, there still seems to be at least good anatomical grounds for modifying the shrug so that the arms are more abducted. A few creative uses of the dumbbell shrug have been proposed by specialist sports physiotherapist Adam Meekins, such as the overhead dumbbell shrug and monkey shrug, which have proven effective in practice. However, a recent 2016 paper published in the Journal of Manual Therapy found the same, albeit high, upper trap activity in the traditional shrug and the overhead shrug, suggesting that there might not be a special benefit to the overhead shrug despite sound theoretical basis. One movement I've been using lately is what I'm calling the lying rope shrug, where I lie down and shrug down and back using a rope that you're actively aiming to pull apart. I feel a really strong upper trap contraction when doing these. The upright row is another money maker for the traps with one study showing it to outperform the seated cable row, barbell row, and lat pull down in terms of VMG activation. And as I mentioned in my shoulder science explained video, a wider two times shoulder width grip on the barbell upright row has been shown to increase activation of both the upper and mid traps relative to a narrow and shoulder width grip. However, to avoid shoulder impingement issues, it's advised to keep elbow elevation below shoulder height. Similarly, rope face pulls are very effective at recruiting the traps when performed with scapular retraction, and they offer a different loading plane than the shrug, which could function as yet another stimulus for maximizing growth. And finally, while I wanted this video to focus on the neck and upper trap area, I'd be remiss to fail to mention the tried and true rowing movements in a video on the traps. And indeed, rowing exercises of all varieties have been substantiated as effective movements in the literature, especially for the mid traps. And interestingly, a 2004 paper by Lehman and colleagues showed no statistically significant difference in mid trap activation between a seated row performed with and without scapular retraction, indicating that the row is really effective at activating this muscle group regardless of scapular position. So what about frequency and volume? 
I think that the neck, like any muscle, is best trained at least two times per week. However, because it can be a chore to train, I suggest that even once per week is better than not training it at all. And research has shown that hitting it three times per week is effective. In my experience, because neck soreness can literally be a pain in the neck, training the neck more frequently with slightly less volume per session is the best way to take advantage of the repeated bout effect and reduce muscle soreness while maximizing results. Because most people will be new to neck training, I think Helms' recommendation to aim for 40 to 70 reps per session with both a flexion and extension-based exercise is a good place to start. As far as traps go, I think that for the sake of recovery and safety, heavy deadlifts should be performed no more than once per week, if at all, given the ability to effectively target the traps through a variety of other movements that can be performed more frequently. Otherwise, I think hitting the traps two to three times a week should be sufficient, but keep in mind when designing your weekly routine that many other back exercises and shoulder exercises will have a lot of carryover to the traps. So be careful not to let weekly volume get carried away. As a starting place, I'd recommend adding in six to 10 extra sets per week of an upper trap isolation movement that you're not already doing and titrate in more volume from there as you assess your recovery and progress. And with these new concepts in mind, I hope the next time you're at an event wearing a dress shirt, you look a little bit more like you lift. What's going on everyone? Uh, throughout the course of making this video, I decided that I wanted to get a little bit more diligent about my own neck and trap training. So I wrote myself an eight week training program that I ended up turning into a complete neck and trap training guide with all of the scientific information, anatomy, biomechanics, and all the exercise science included in this video in one place. And I've also included additional information about periodization and specific programming variables that I didn't get into in the video. Uh, so I've made that full neck and trap training guide available on my website, uh, which you can get to at the link in the description. For the first First week of the launch, it's gonna be just $9.99, and then after that, it'll go up to $14.99. I'm gonna be documenting this on my Snapchat and Instagram story, and every week I'll give a quick update on how my training is going and how my progress is going, and I'd love for you guys to do the same. I've included an email in the neck and trap guide. You can email your starting photos and your starting neck measurement too, and then after the eight weeks, take another set of photos and another measurement of your neck, because there isn't a whole lot of data uh, on neck training, and so if I can gather some of my own data in the form of you guys, that would be very much appreciated. And also it gives you guys a way to be accountable and for me to be accountable as well. And this is a 30 page document that includes 12 scientific references, full eight week training program. Uh, everything is laid out. As for now, that's gonna conclude this one. So thank you guys so much for watching. Uh, subscribe to the channel if you're new. Uh, like the video if you liked it. And I'll see you guys in the next one.